Fantastic. So, so as we can all see, delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Nicola Reed, um, clinical consultant, clinical psychologist, uh, who's going to talk to us uh, about the psychological aspects of renal failure and transplant. Welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I think, as Hussein said, it feels very strange that I'm talking to a screen, but I hope that I will see some nodding. And um, I think likewise to Hussein, Jane, if you want to let me know if there's questions as we go along, it might make more sense to answer them as and when. So yes, just to introduce myself, I'm Nicola. I'm the clinical psychologist that works alongside Hussein and all of the team at Manchester. Um, we have a small renal psychology service there that looks after patients that come through renal medicine and through the renal transplant unit. Um, yes. Here we go, so just a brief plan of what I'm hoping to talk to you all about today. Um, a little bit about what we know about the psychological aspects of renal difficulties and transplant. Uh, a little bit about what can be difficult and why. Um, I'm gonna talk quite a bit about how we all manage our emotions. Um, definitely about post-transplant emotions, what can come up for all of us. Um, hopefully more about what can help and it'll hopefully be useful. And then just a little bit of a think about the kind of sources of support that are available for people. I'm conscious that I'm speaking to lots of you who may be Manchester based. I'm talking to lots of you that will not be Manchester based. So I know that there will be some variation across the country in terms of support. So I hope the resources are useful. Um, I suppose the other thing to say is that I'm conscious that Obviously, I'm going to touch on some potentially upsetting or difficult feelings today. Um, I'm afraid I wouldn't be a psychologist if I didn't. Um, but I suppose it's just to give a bit of a heads up that um, looking after ourselves is obviously important. And if you may notice that it touches on something personal to you, which you may find difficult, I just want us to have a little think about who we might speak to and how we might take care of ourselves. Okay. So what do we know? Well, we know lots. We know that um, it can be useful when we're thinking about our physical health, whether that's renal difficulties or any other physical health condition that we might be managing. It's useful to have a sort of biopsychosocial model in mind. This is a fancy way of saying that when particularly psychologists are working with people, they are often thinking about the biological factors that impact on how we feel emotionally and the social factors and obviously the psychological factors as well. And you can see from this diagram, they're all inter intermeshed and they all have a part to play in how we feel overall in terms of our mental health. Um, and I suppose this diagram I like because it clearly shows that we have no physical health without a mental health. And that's thinking about all of the factors that play a part in our ability to look after ourselves and how we can definitely engage with our healthcare. That's why we have a renal psychologist in our unit. Okay, what we also know is that managing a health condition is, and it definitely impacts on our psychological health. And that's across the board. That doesn't mean that people will always need to speak to a psychologist, but it does mean that it is understandably difficult to do. Uh, what we also know is often people are in a position where they're not just managing one condition. And I suppose from Hussain's talk, that's really clear in terms of PKD. We know that people are managing all sorts of different areas of health as a result of their PKD. It's not just about their kidneys. And I suppose that in itself brings with it some inherent stressful situations. So you may have multiple different professional teams involved. Often that means lots and lots of hospital appointments. That means lots and lots of communication. Unfortunately, that also means there's more opportunity to feel that communication isn't great. I've always worked in the NHS and I love it for all sorts of reasons, but I also see its faults. And I know that it can also be incredibly stressful when you as patients are responsible for navigating that. So I suppose broadly speaking, it's what we all know, which is that our physical health impacts on our psychological health and vice versa. So how we're feeling emotionally definitely has an impact on how able we are to look after ourselves. And what is so clear from Hussein's talk is that what is so important when we're thinking about transplant, and obviously that's what we're focusing on today, is that our ability to engage in that, our ability to look after ourselves is definitely impacted by our physical health. How able we are to turn up to appointments, how able we are to take on information, how able we are to even take tablets. 
um, is all impacted by how we are feeling emotionally. And I know all of you will always already be aware of this. And I suppose just thinking a bit more specifically about renal difficulties and what can be difficult. And I suppose here are a list of the most common emotional reactions that certainly I and the rest of the team see when people are reacting either to a new diagnosis of renal difficulties or so a new diagnosis potentially of PKD, or it might be that they've had that diagnosis for a very long time, but we might see reactions when they reach different phases of renal problems. Um, so this might be when discussions are being had about dialysis and treatment choices. It might be when you're having those discussions about transplant and the work up to transplant. It might be post-transplant. But these, I guess, are the most common reactions that lots and lots and lots of people describe. And I would guess that most of you will look at that list and be able to tick lots of them off, if not all of them, at the same time. So... With, if we go through them, we often see people describing an immense sense of shock. This might be around even when you've had a diagnosis for a very long time. This isn't just unique to people that are newly diagnosed. diagnosed. And shock in itself is something that we probably all have experience of. It's that feeling that we get when we are completely overwhelmed and stunned by something that has happened to us. Next, we have um, denial which can actually be a very um, protective emotion that we can all experience. This is when we maybe feel that what we are being faced with is too huge or too difficult for us to comprehend or for us to attend to at the time. I suppose what we might see is this can make it more difficult for people to do things like have conversations about their health care. It might make it incredibly difficult for people to turn up for appointments. It might mean that when the doctors start talking about transplant or dialysis, People are quite openly saying, I don't want to talk about that. I suppose sometimes it might be less obvious and people might just feel like that's something that's never going to happen to me. Um, and again, it's something that can definitely be protective, but over the long term can cause more problems. Worry and anxiety are feelings that all of us experience, sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes um, at more distinct periods in our life. Um, and again, this might be a time when talking to somebody like me or somebody from your renal support team might be appropriate. Anger and frustration. So these are emotions that we all feel when we have a real sense of unfairness of something that has happened to us. And certainly when we come to diagnosis of renal difficulties, absolutely a sense of unfairness is often present. There's nothing fair about the diagnosis that people receive low mood and depression so this might be a sense of sadness which turns into more longer term difficulties often people who have experienced these emotions might also describe a sense of hopelessness or despair and um, confusion so a full sense of i don't know what's happening i don't know why and um, uncertainty is certainly there there's lots of un unknowns in terms of renal difficulties and renal transplant and I think Hussein touched on that really nicely in terms of absolutely there's lots of questions that people naturally want to ask and sometimes the answer unfortunately is which only when you don't know but how difficult that is to sit with. And I think, you know, at a time of great uncertainty within renal difficulties and beyond as we sit here during a pandemic, I think most of us can really relate to this emotion. And then also dealing with losses or even trauma. And I suppose I put losses here, not just in terms of loss, in terms of maybe um, loss of function or loss of health but I also think often with people about um, changes in their lives as losses so maybe a loss in terms of a job or relationship as a result of health difficulties but also loss in terms of an idea that we might have had about our life and how it was going to look and um, trauma is certainly there as well because we know that renal difficulties and the treatment for those difficulties can unfortunately lead to very traumatic experiences in some circumstances okay I suppose my main my major point about what can be difficult and why is that all of these emotions and reactions are completely normal 
normal reactions to abnormal situations. And when I mean an abnormal situation, I mean the stressful situation that people find themselves in when they're managing a chronic condition like PKD. Okay, so I'm gonna talk just a little bit here and then excuse all the arrows. Psychologists love arrows, they're, they're mad about them. Um, but um, I suppose I just wanted us to think a little bit about how we all manage our emotions. And obviously psychologists, neuroscientists, have done lots of work in this area. And this is a model that I find really useful and I hope that you do too. Um, and I suppose it draws on lots of evidence to show that broadly speaking in our, in our brains, how we manage our emotions um, can be divided into these three systems. And broadly speaking, this is thinking about our threat system. Now this is the part of our minds and brains which looks after us. It's about keeping us safe and protecting us. It's actually a very old part of our brain and um, that is predominantly um, responsible for this system. This is about the keeping us safe. And it is how we respond to threats whether that's perceived threats, so threats that we might have in our mind, or whether that's actual threats. So when we're crossing a road and a, and a car comes out very quickly, this is the part of our brain that kicks into action and keeps us safe. We then have in the blue circle, our drive system. This is the stuff that gets us up and about. It is about goals. It's about doing stuff. It's how we get up and about in the morning. It might be how we achieve things in life, uh, whether that be to do with work or family or all sorts of other area. This is about seeking out and doing. And then most importantly, I would argue, we have our soothing system. This is the part of our brains that's responsible for managing our emotions when we need to feel safe, when we need to feel content. And this is the part which we might think about when we're much younger, um, when a young child is distressed or finding things difficult, that their caregiver would look after them, keep them safe, pick them up even, have that contact and calm things back down for them. Now, as we grow up, those experiences feed into these systems. And what we have to do as adults is manage our emotions. And this is the part of our brain, the part of our emotional um, system, which is responsible for that. And I'm gonna go back to this and I hope it might make a little bit more sense why I'm talking about how we manage our emotions. So if we just think for a little bit about what happens in our threat system, that red blob at the bottom of the last diagram. So if we think about a time when we maybe all feel a bit under threat, we don't have to think about the most traumatic times in our lives. But if I think about today, coming on here, I'm talking to lots of you. Um, I know I can't see you all, but I know that I'm here and hopefully you're listening. Um, but I suppose that might mean that I start to think a little bit through my threat system. So I might notice that I feel maybe not quite as relaxed as I would be on a regular Saturday morning. Um, I might feel a bit more tense. My breathing might increase, my heart rate goes up. Um, I, I don't today, but I suppose if it was feeling more stressful, I might feel like I want to get out. My body might be getting ready to run away. Um, my attention changes, the way that I think. So we talk about a threat lens. That's why that magnifying glass is that. We might notice that we really focus down on a sense of threat or danger. We might be looking for it. We scan for that threat. And then in terms of our behavior, it changes. So we might be thinking about how can I get out of this? I want to avoid it. And we might even see reactions like defending, attacking, or completely cutting off, much like that ostrich. And I suppose what we know about our threat system is that, it, like I said before, it's about keeping us safe. It's protective. Lots of you will have heard about fight, flight or freeze response. So if we were in a very threatening situation, it would be completely appropriate that we would kick into action. We would do these things and we would do this because we get this massive surge of stress hormones at the same time. It can lead to quite uncomfortable feelings like anger and anxiety and fear. And obviously that threat can be external, it can be from outside, or it could be internal. It might be the way that we're thinking. Um, so there's thoughts about, oh, I'm gonna be rubbish at this, or people are gonna think I'm not any good. They're the kind of threats that can come more internally. And obviously for some people, they might find that that's more easily activated than in others. And that can be informed by previous experiences that they might have had. And I think this is important when we think about renal difficulties, when we think about the potential sources of threat 
when somebody is either faced with a diagnosis or managing that condition long term. So there's lots of potential sources of threat. Um, and these are just a few that I often talk to people about, you know, so there's lots of uncertainty, we have to make really difficult decisions, definitely information overload, there's lots of technical language, it's really quite complicated some of it, how do we make sense of it all, especially when we're already in a threat system, uh, we might be facing new environments, certainly new people, when we think about things like dialysis particularly, um, there's certainly I'm just going to say, of... Nicola, sorry to jump in. No, that's fine. Some, sometimes uh, people with PKD are faced with all of those things all at once. Absolutely. So then it becomes yeah. a really big challenge. Yeah, absolutely. So no wonder, given all of that, that, you know, that person's threat system is probably going to be in the driving seat at that point. And what we know is that can make it even more difficult then to take on information, to make decisions, to engage in treatment. And I think that's useful for us to think about definitely, Jane. So I just wanted to think a little bit um, about transplant specifically, because obviously that's uh, for a good reason why lots of you are here today. And I suppose these are often some of the most common things, both that people come and talk to me about, but also that kind of there's lots of good evidence for. And these are kind of, again, what I would describe as very normal reactions to an abnormal situation. So we might notice that people have apprehension about life after transplant. So absolutely, there's lots of brilliant, good and exciting things that might come with transplant, but we're also aware that we can feel different things about the same thing. So we can feel there's good, but there's also maybe things that we find more challenging. So we might be thinking, well, that's great, but there's gonna be a real change in my role. Um, it might even be that there's a new routine, you know, there's lots of downsides to dialysis, but there's also lots of routine associated with it. It's what we become very used to, especially if you do it for years and years and years, not least the people that you were around for all of that time. And then suddenly that social network changes very dramatically. I suppose, there may also be some difficult or traumatic experience associated with the transplant itself. Now, as Hussein says, lots of these experiences might be quite rare, but they do happen. And I suppose for some people that can add to the difficulties post-transplant when they're thinking about how they feel their emotional health. health. Certainly worries about transplant fading is something that lots of people describe, there's lots of evidence in the literature about, it's an understandable worry that lots of people are sort of living with and managing. This idea about the impact on the relationship with donor, and obviously that's in the circumstance where you may know your donor, um, but also sometimes difficult feelings about the donor that you didn't know and will never know. And sometimes that in itself can be something that people are having to manage. I put this one here particularly because and the should is in bold, but feelings of guilt. So sometimes people often describe to me, you know, I should be happy. I've got this gift of life as it is termed by some, but actually I feel a bit rotten and I don't feel so great. And my mood isn't wonderful. And I had all these hopes maybe of how things might turn out and I'm just not there yet. Um, body image changes so obviously we know that the surgery itself but also the treatment can lead to body image changes which has an emotional impact and difficulties with taking treatment or follow-up so absolutely certainly in the immediate um, aftermath of transplant there's a really intensive period of tweaking around your medications which I know Sean's going to talk about but also in terms of the contact that you might be having with hospitals, um, which in itself can be really difficult, especially if you're already um, managing maybe some difficult experiences that you've had as a result of that. So yeah, I'm sure lots of you um, might be looking at that and thinking, oh my gosh. <laughs> but I suppose I also wanted to think about um, the emotional impact of transplant in terms of the positive emotions that lots of people describe to me. Um, and I suppose particularly this idea, which psychologists talk about post-traumatic growth. Um, and now this is an idea of positive psychological changes coming about as a result of really challenging times in our lives. And it, this doesn't have to just apply to transplant. Obviously, I think anybody who is managing a chronic health condition will have experience of how they may have changed psychologically because of what they've been through because of that diagnosis. 
And again, this isn't me um, putting a shiny slant on things. This is actually something that is very well evidenced um, in the literature. And there's sort of three main areas that people describe these changes in this sense of growth in. Um, one is about learning about our own abilities. So having a wisdom about kind of what we can do, what we can overcome. One is about perspective taking. Um, and again, I'm not for a minute suggesting that anybody would ask for these adverse um, challenges in order to appreciate this, but it is almost a byproduct sometimes for some people. And this is a sense of having a really clear understanding of what is important to us. And that really driving us forward in terms of how we live our lives. Strengthening of relationships is often described in terms of those that have stood around us and been on this difficult challenge alongside us. And of course, post-transplant post life, you know, that there can be excitement and possibilities, whether that might be travel or changes in work or social situation um, and a lack of restrictions in a way that you might have really experienced before transplant. OK, so what can help? Obviously, I'm going to go back to the green blob here. This is about our soothing system, the stuff that allows us to rest and restore. And having this system well exercised is something that we all need to be thinking about, but we particularly need to be thinking about when we might be going through something like transplant or the work up to it. So the soothing system is often termed by psychologists as a sort of rest and restore part of our brains. And the ways that we can really work it out, give it some physio, is about feeling connected and feeling soothed. And I think when we think particularly about transplant, this might be having open conversations with your care team and those close to you about any of the worries or concerns that you have. You know, when I think back to that, one of my first slides around these are normal reactions. This isn't because you're not managing or not coping. These are exactly what we would expect to see when being faced with what you're being faced with. Um, we also know, and there's really good evidence for this, that if your expectations of how things might go match your experience, then people do better emotionally. So if you can have open conversations with your care team about what to expect, if you can engage in um, webinars like this, where you're given lots of information about what to expect, that can really help in terms of you managing your emotional health, as well as you getting yourself into the best physical condition to be able to go through transplant. I put about peer support, obviously PKD are very involved in that. Um, and again, it might be helpful to talk to other regional patients who've maybe been through those experiences. We're not saying that you'll have the same experience, but it can be helpful in itself in terms of feeling connected. In terms of the feeling soothed, this is about doing things that we enjoy. Um, feeling comforting. Um, thinking about techniques which maybe calm your body and mind. And most importantly, being self-compassionate. Now there's loads of good evidence for this. I'm not gonna go into it all today, but certainly rather than those shoulds, which we often hear, it's thinking about, it's understandable that I feel this way. No wonder, who wouldn't? Okay, just briefly, because I know I'm obviously talking to lots of different people today, and this accounts for absolutely everybody that, was, that I'm speaking to, not least, in the middle of a pandemic, but there's lots of evidence to show there's sort of five key areas that all of us should be looking at when we're thinking about our emotional health. And if we're thinking about work up to transplant um, or any stage of our renal difficulties, these are the areas that all of us need to be thinking about in our lives. So broadly speaking, these are about being connected, being active, and I do have a caveat to that, taking notice, keeping learning and giving. So it's a time when all of us will be feeling that being connected to others is very different, not least that I'm talking to you all on the screen at the moment, um, but absolutely spending time and having supportive relationships with people that have a positive impact on your well-being. I can't um, stress enough. It being active, so I'm not for a minute suggesting going to a gym or like Hussain says, we're not talking about going running a marathon. This might be about um, stretch, this might be about um, gentle strengthening exercises or chair work um, and I know somebody's going to talk about this later in the day um, but these are massively important not just in terms of your physical health but in terms of your psychological health. 
um, keeping learning. So this might be, I'm not saying everyone has to go out and learn a language, but it might be about um, learning more about your health condition, if that feels helpful. It might be um, a new skill um, or a hobby that you've previously enjoyed and stopped. Um, giving to others, so even as small as that can count. So this might be a smile or a wave today to somebody who's watching. It might be um, larger acts such as getting involved with a charity or a local community, because these have the benefits not just of improving your mental well-being, but also building those social networks at a time when all of us can feel more isolated than normal, but also when we think about health conditions and what that does to our social networks, how important that is. Now I've put here about being mindful. This is the bit about being in the moment and um, being more aware of the present moment, including how your thoughts and feelings are impacting on you. And um, we know that there's really good evidence that this can have a positive change on the way you feel, but also how you approach challenges. And when you're living with a chronic health condition, then absolutely you're facing challenges all of the time. Anything that you can have in your toolkit, so to speak, can only be helpful. Mm -hmm. I'll go on now to um, some sources of support. Um, so absolutely speak to your renal care team or another trusted professional. It might be that you have a specialist nurse or a GP that you particularly feel able to open up to. Um, you might be in a position where you think, actually, these, these feelings aren't going away. I'm finding it more difficult. They're getting in the way of me being able to look after myself. And at that point, I would be stressing that there is support out there. And there's a useful link there in terms of looking in your locality for talking therapies, whether that's access to a psychologist or a counsellor. It may also be that obviously your own renal service has someone like me, a renal clinical psychologist or a renal counsellor who can obviously offer psychological support alongside your renal care team. Um, and there I've just put some other useful links, which I'm not expecting you to look at now, but they might be links that you could use um, when you look back at the presentation at the end. Okay, thank you very much. Fantastic, Th th thanks Nicola. Do, are, there, are there any questions? You bang on time there, by the way. Oh, well, that's, that's always good to know. That's thank you, Nicola, that was really, really interesting. I've just been keeping an eye on the question and answer. Now, there's a, someone has asked about transplant and does it affect your sex life? Now we know there's two aspects, there's the medical aspects, yeah. There's also what's in your head. So it could be medications, or it could yeah. be you as a person. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, absolutely. And Hussein might, or Sean might want to come in in terms of medication and the sort of physical aspects of it. But certainly, you know, if we think about that slide that I put up at the beginning with those three circles, you know, things like our sex life, which is part of our drive system, the stuff that we get lots of reward for. It's a, an amazing part of our life that we need to, is really important to people. I think absolutely, I can, there's certainly evidence and there's certainly um, people that often speak to me about how that can change. And I think there's lots of factors that influence that psychologically. So sometimes that might be about um, body image changes that might have happened post-transplant sometimes it might be about mood so what we know is that when we maybe feel lower in mood we notice a drop in libido so a drop in the sex drive that we might have it might be that there's been a change in the relationship as a result of um, the health difficulties that that person's been managing and I suppose Absolutely, we also wouldn't ignore the factors that could be at play in terms of medication and in terms of kind of physical effects of surgery. Um, so absolutely, it, it could be the case. And I suppose, again, I would be talking about a sort of biopsychosocial approach in terms of looking at those factors and kind of thinking through with that person what might be going on here. But yes, absolutely, it would make a lot of sense. Nicola, I wanted to ask, do you, I mean, and you, you did touch on it a little bit, do you think there is a, a resistant in, in uh, patients, re resistance in patients post-transplant to share and be open about their negative emotions because there's this um, almost pressure to, to, to just be grateful? And of course, all transplant yeah. recipients are incredibly grateful. Um, but, but do you think they, that, that because of the pressures around them of people sort of saying, well, you've had your transplant, you should be okay now. 
and yeah. that maybe they keep quiet that they're feeling they're not feeling right yeah absolutely I think that is very much at play I think um that sense of guilt that so many people describe you know not just to me I'm not just talking in terms of me I can hear lots of references but I didn't think that would be helpful but um I suppose a sense of you know the transplant process is long and can feel quite arduous and I think then there is this sense of well it's happened now you've got through it great you know and it, it, and it which is true but I suppose then it's very difficult isn't it when those shoulds come along of you know I've been given this gift of life and yet life either doesn't quite look like how I'd hoped or actually do you know what the other things about life that were difficult anyway and impacted on my mood are still there and I think that can be difficult not just for the person that's received the transplant but also I suppose sometimes that pressure you write that comes externally you know sort of people saying oh isn't it great you've had a transplant and let's crack on um so I think absolutely I think that can compound those difficult feelings but also make it harder to say actually I'm finding this really hard actually I'm struggling a little bit here and I think that's why I would really be stressing the importance of letting your care team know um, or letting you know other supportive professionals know or those around you if that is the case because it is completely normal you know you've gone through such a um, such a challenging time that it would be absolutely very strange if people weren't left with some difficult emotions as well as some of the positives so yeah definitely thank you Susan have you got any more questions because we're sort of slightly running over now due to going to the break no, I think we can all safely go for a break get your kettles boiled can I take this opportunity to just remind everyone we're not using a raised hand facility today if you have any questions at all if you want to pop them into the question answer we'll certainly do our best to cover everything okay enjoy your cuppa <laughs> fantastic well Thank you very much. We'll see you all um, at 11.45, where we're going to meet uh, Liz Evans, uh, who is a uh, senior physiotherapist. Oh, it's hard for me to say that. Put my teeth back in. Senior physiotherapist um, uh, for critical care and surgery. So see you all soon. Thank you very much for who's, uh, to Hussein and Nicola. I think you might be back later, though. I know, I know Hussein is, but Nicola, I'm not sure about you yet, but uh, see you all soon. Thank you.